So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then, then we're going to begin. Uh, Father, I thank you for this uh, opportunity uh, to come uh, to this place, worship you together with our brothers and sisters in Christ, in spirit and in truth. Father, we pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning and uh, that you would be glorified in everything that's said and done. And we ask this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. All right, uh, Matthew chapter 6, uh, we've spent some time uh, looking at the concept of worry, and the reality is that we all struggle with worry in some form or fashion, uh, and Jesus specifically calls out here uh, worrying about God not being able or willing to provide for your needs, and last week we looked at the reality that Worry has an eye complex. Uh, when anxiety controls your thinking, it is actually you saying, I don't think you can handle this situation, God. I think I have to do it on my own. And it's much, uh, much like uh, pride and, and how, how pride works. Uh, it is about me and I must do this. And so we're going to take a couple minutes here, and uh, we're going to look at uh, Matthew uh, chapter 6 uh, a little more in depth. Um, last week, we pretty much just read through uh, what Jesus was uh, saying here as far as uh, where he talks about the birds of the air and the grass of the field and the, the flowers, uh, and I said we were going to come back to that, and so it's time for us to take a little bit of a deeper look. So we're going to start in verse 25. Uh, Jesus says this, he says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Uh, depending on what kind of translation you, you have, uh, King James translates it better than they. Uh, maybe if you have the ESV or something like that, uh, he, it says uh, of more value. And the issue here is value. Uh, we have a misunderstanding of our value to God. Now, value is something that that uh, I think all of us have some sort of a grasp on. Um, I'm going to give you an illustration here with this little dog. All right? Yeah, he is. Actually, uh, this is my son's little dog. Uh, it was a gift from Norm and Barb Heyman uh, when Hannah was born. It's like, well, he needs a little animal. I don't know if they even remember it. I'm sure Norm didn't pick it out. Uh, but at any rate... Um, this is Mark's little dog, and Mark places great value on this dog. Now, there was a time when uh, me and Sarah, we had this conversation, and Sarah told me this story about how she had this little prized stuff, stuffed animal when she was a small child, and best I remember from the story, it got lost on an airplane, and it wrecked her little world because there was no way to get it back. And so she said, we want to protect my, my children from having one prized possession toy. Or one prized possession stuffed animal. And I don't know how she lost hers. I still have mine. His name's Lockley. I didn't lose him. But uh, uh, at any rate, so Mark had this, this vast... I don't think smorgasbord is the, anim or the, the phrase I'm looking for, but he had a bunch of different animals that he, he took to bed with him. He had horse, cow, doggy, and the others were all sporadic, like whatever he could pick up and take to bed with him that day. And they all had an equal value. But we went on a trip to New York, and we came back from that trip Doggy, out of all the animals, Doggy was left in New York. And because 
he was disconnected from doggy, even though he still had horse, cow, his birds, his lambs, and all these other animals. All of those not meant nothing to him in comparison to the dog that was lost. And because of that, every night when we, go, when we put him into bed, he'll wait till after I finish telling him a Bible story, and he'll say, where's doggy? Like, why couldn't you have taken care of this before? But because he lost doggy, he places a very high value on him. Value is something that is not set by the person who uh, is trying to sell something. Value is set by what someone is willing to pay for it. Uh, value is, uh, of, uh, of goods and services is, is, see how good you are at economics here, is, de is determined by what? Supply and demand. You can have all the supply in the world. But if there ain't no demand for it, it's worthless. Like if you had a container ship full of those three and a half inch floppy disk, or maybe even the ones that were bigger than that, I've never actually seen a computer that uses them, you can have a lot of them. You can have an insane supply of them, but there's no demand for them. They are worthless. Uh, people in the real estate business, they run into this. Uh, I've talked to real estate agents that were trying to help someone sell a house and, and, they, and the person who owns the house, they said, well, I want to list it for this much. And the real estate agent says, this is what it's worth because this is what people are paying for houses in your area. No, I want, to pay, I want an extra $50,000 out of my house. It's not going to happen. Because the value is not there. And we, uh, Jesus here, where he's talking to, these, uh, to his, his disciples and all of these other people who were there, he is explaining to them their value. Now let's, let's look at the, this passage again. And he says in verse, uh, 25, verse 26, Behold the fowl of the air. For they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? You have more value to God than the birds of the air. And it's the theme that's carried out throughout this passage because verse 27, he points out, he says, Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? Some of your translations say, uh, can add... Uh, uh, time to his life. Um, life is probably the better translation here than stature um, because um, David makes a very similar uh, statement in Psalm chapter 39 where he says, teach me to measure my days. And we don't think about measuring time by using a ruler, but that, that's probably what Jesus is saying here. He's like, Consider how big your lifespan is, and can you add anything to it? Let's go down to the next verse. Verse 28. He says, And why take you any thought for your raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. He's like, I want you to take a second. And he said, I want you to think about the flowers. He's like, think about how beautiful they are and how, how you can't even compare with making clothing that is as beautiful and as amazing as a flower which was created by God. And then he comes back into talking about value again in verse 30. He says, wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? Should he not much more clothe you? He said, I want you to think about this. He says, the grass grows up, you, you eat part of it, and the rest of it, you, you burn it up. It has, has no value at that point. And he said, God, he clothes the grass of the field, and he says, won't he do a lot more than you? Because 
you're worth more than the grass. And I think to wrap our mind around this, we have to step back in time to creation itself. I want you to think about the creation that, that God made. And he created the, the atmosphere, and he created the trees, he created the, the birds, he created the animals. But the masterpiece of the creation of God was mankind. He created you a little bit different. It says that he breathed in him a living soul. He has a relationship with Adam that is different from the relationship with every other creature and every other thing that he made. Now, after he created everything else, he says, it was good, or it is good. But man was a little bit different. In fact, he gives man charge over and dominion over the rest of creation. He created man a little bit different, a lot bit different, because he has a different purpose for us. And then sin happens. Your worth at creation, Adam and Eve's worth at creation, was a great worth. They had a great value. But after their sin, their value was shot. Because they were dead in their sins. Just like we are born dead in our sins. We have nothing in ourselves to offer God. It's like you, you think of, of a car. I, I have a, a 1997 Honda CRV that I bought off of uh, Bob and Judy. And the value of that car, it had diminished a lot for Bob and Judy because they parted with it. Okay? And I, I like the car, and I'm, I place a, a good value on it because I'm going to drive it until it is dead. One way or the other. Either Sarah's going to borrow my car and wreck it, and then it's going to be dead. No, I'm just kidding. It'll probably end up being me. She's a better driver than I am. Or the car's just eventually going to fall apart to the point where its value is going to be practically nothing because it's wore out or it's broken. That's us. We are wore out. We are broken. Sin is has broken us, but God still places value on you in your brokenness. It has nothing to do with what you can do. It has nothing to do with who you are or what you're capable of. It has everything to do with His demand, what He wants. He desperately wants you even though you don't deserve him because of your sin. The best illustration that I can think of in scripture of this is the story of the prodigal son. And uh, if you want to turn there, uh, you can. It's uh, in Luke chapter 15. Uh, we're actually going to look at this this week and next week. Next week we're going into talking about judging. Like judging others. And Jesus talks about how we should not judge. And Jesus here in this passage in Luke chapter 15 he is pointing out to the Pharisees that they are no better than the scribe or than the publicans and the sinners. You see, they were upset because in chapter 15, verse 1, it says, then, uh, then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners, and he eats with them. And so next week, we're going we're gonna to finish tearing this, this, uh, this story apart, but we're going to jump a little bit ahead uh, this morning uh, to look at the parable uh, itself. So Jesus is uh, basically he's calling out the Pharisees here. He's calling them out because they felt like they were better than everyone else. They placed value on themselves that was not realistic. And Jesus gives three parables here. The first one is the story of the lost sheep. 
He says in verse 4, he says, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, doeth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And it says that when he found it, he laid it on his shoulders and he rejoiced. And you read on down two verses and you find out that they went home and they had a party. These three stories have one big thing in common. And the one big thing that they have in common is the fact that after each one of these lost items is found, they throw a stinking party. You're like, why would you throw a party over, over finding one, one sheep? It's because the Jewish nation lived in a, in a guilt and shame driven society. It was guilt versus honor. And every society experienced this, this to an extent, but not like the Jewish culture and not like the, uh, like the Arab culture. To this day, if you are a, a Muslim, in, living in a Muslim country, and you surrender your life to Christ, the reproach that you bring and the shame that you bring on your family will probably wind you up either beaten or dead. They put a lot of emphasis on this either honor or shame. Shame brings a couple of things with it. It brings guilt with it. I will guilt you into making this right. It brings anxiety with it. I don't want to shame my family. I don't want to shame my friends. I don't want to be shamed. And when Jesus gives this illustration of the shepherd that lost a sheep, it was a shameful thing for a shepherd to lose one of his sheep. He was short-sighted. He let it go. And he says this shepherd, when he realizes and he, he makes this statement. He says, and what man of you? He points out to them. He's like, I'm talking directly to you. He says, which one of you, if you lost one sheep, would you not go find it? He understood their heart. He understood where they were at. They understood the parable. He says he'll lay it on his shoulders and he'll rejoice. And he's going to go and he's going to tell his friends. And they're going to have a party that night over that sheep. And they get that. He says in verse 8, he says, Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she loses one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently to find it. He says, let's say that a woman loses one of the ten coins that are, are her, uh, basically her, the dowry that was given for her. Like this is, this is a thing of honor. My, my parents gave this dowry on my behalf, and I lost one of the coins. And he says, which one of you women, if you lost that dowry, or if you prize your mar marriage, you could say you lost your wedding ring, you're going you're to tear your house apart trying to find that thing. It has a value to you. And he says, which one of you is not going to sweep the, the dirt and the straw around in the floor? You're going to light a candle and you're going to do whatever it takes to find that lost coin. And when you find it, you're going to be so excited. You're going to go get your friends and you guys are probably going to throw a party that night. You're going to celebrate because you found that lost coin. The point here being something that is lost does not necessarily have no value. In fact, some of the most valuable things on this planet are things that are lost or that have been lost at some point or some time. When something is lost, you recognize how important it is. When something is lost, you look at it differently. I want it back. I'll do whatever it takes to get the doggy back. Let's drive back to New York tonight and get the doggy back. Mark, it's a long ways. It's okay. Mom can drive fast. He really says that. His mom is a fast driver. If she gets behind you, let her, let her go around. All right? So, but value comes from desire. 
And value is set by sacrifice. What are you willing to give for that item? What are you willing to surrender to get that thing that you want? If you could imagine for just a moment a piece of artwork uh, showing up that was lost from either uh, Leonardo or Donatello or Michelangelo or Raphael. And if you haven't figured it out, the only reason I know those artists' names is because of the Ninja Turtles. They're all named after Renaissance artists. And so if, if, a, if, a, if a painting from uh, um, Leonardo da Vinci pops up, that's been lost forever, like people are going to be offering you insane amounts of money, like sight unseen, because of the value that is placed on it. My, uh, yeah, you, you, get, you get the drift. Value is placed by what someone is willing to pay for something. And there are collectors out there that would literally swander their life savings to be able to own a prized piece of artwork. God is no different. He created you for a reason. He created you for a purpose. And that purpose is to glorify Him. That purpose is to honor Him. Revelation tells us that for His pleasure, they are and were created. You were created not for your pleasure, but for the pleasure of God. And then He goes into the big parable, the parable of the prodigal son. I'm not really sure why this has been dubbed the, the prodigal son, because this parable is all about the Father. Without the Father, the Son has no meaning. Without the Father, the Son doesn't come home. And without the Father's humility, the Son never has a place back in His family. The emphasis is on the Father. The Son is the one that has the problem. Jesus gives these first two examples to them, and they can understand them. I understand why you would go and pursue that sheep. I understand why you would tear your house apart looking for that lost coin. But when Jesus explains to them or gives them the parable of the, the prodigal son or the, the, the son that was lost, this messes with their thinking. This messes with their understanding. We start in verse 11. It says... Uh, um, and he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, and he took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance on riotous living. I'm going to stop there for just a second. The older son would have gotten two-thirds of the inheritance. The younger son would have gotten a third of the inheritance. But something crazy happens here. He says, in a few days, in a few days, he packs up and leaves. Now, if you have a third of your vast father's inheritance and you get rid of it in the matter of a few days, what does that mean you're getting for it? Not much. I'll get what I can take. He placed no value on what the Father had. It's, I'll get what I can take. I'm out of here. See you later. Verse 14. And it says, And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and he joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed the swine. So let's put this in perspective. He takes what he got out of his part of the inheritance, which why he would go and ask this is beyond me. He was literally saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. 
I want my inheritance now. A heartless, selfish young man. And he takes that same character as he goes into this foreign land and he spends everything on riotous living. It doesn't say here what the riotous living is, but when he does come back, now I'll spoil the story for you, his brother says that he spent all of his money on prostitutes. He just threw it away. And after he threw it away, there came a famine up in the land. And now nobody has anything. He's poor. And the people who actually have some stuff and have some money, like they are are, uh, struggling as well. And it says that he joined himself. He didn't get a job. The word here used for join, it literally means to cleave or to hold on to. He was following this guy around like a little parasite, trying to find some way to survive in this situation that he had himself in. And the guy sends him into the field to feed the swine, but we find out in the next verse that he's not actually the one feeding the pigs. It's not him that's feeding them, he's just there. It says that he would fain, uh, hold on, I lost my place here. Yeah, verse 16. It says, and he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. This man says, get off my back and go out with them to go and feed the pigs out in the field, which your culture regards as unclean, and when you go out there... Get out of my hair. All right? Just go, go. But when he gets out there, he wanted to eat the pods that they were feeding the pigs. The only problem is, it's not even possible for a human to digest these pods that they were feeding these pigs. But he was so hungry that he was willing to eat them if he could get them. He was in the pits. It's as low as he could have possibly gotten in his life. He went from being the one that was shelling out the money to following the guy around that had the money, just hoping for something to eat. And in verse 17, it says, And when he came to himself, had a reality check there, it's like, oh man, this is not working out. There's got to be something better than this. It says, and when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? He's like, my father's day laborers eat better than I'm eating right now because I'm not even getting to eat what the pigs are eating. He's like, my life is shot. I have nothing to offer. I have no value, but maybe... Maybe if I go home, my father will do something for me. In verse 18, he says, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. He says, I'm going to confess that I have messed up, and my life is jacked up. I'm going to confess that to God, or confess that to the Father, like we would confess that to God. But then he starts thinking in his mind. In verse 19, he says, I am no more worthy to be called thy son, so make me as one of thine hired servants. He's going in with this mentality, I have shamed my family. My family probably won't let me back in, but maybe when I get there, I can barter with dad. Maybe when I get there, I can say, dad, I've been starving. I have nothing left. Just let me be one of your hired servants. I will work, I will do whatever you want me to do, I would be content being one of your servants and not a son any longer. He was looking for a job and he was looking for food is what he was looking for. And so he makes up his mind and he goes home. Verse 20 says, he arose and he came to his father, but while he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion on him and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. 
Was this the reaction that this man was expecting? Not even close. They lived in a culture of either honor or dishonor. He had dishonored his family. You remember with the story of, of David and Absalom when, when he banishes Absalom from, from, uh, from Israel and he says, you can't come back because you killed Amnon. And Joab, through the course of time, finally he says, hey, why don't, we, why don't we let him come back? Why don't you let him come back? He's your son. And he lets him come back, but he will not even give him audience. He won't talk to Absalom. He won't look at Absalom. He hold, holds Absalom like at arm's length for a couple of years. You can come back in, but watch this. If he had allowed Absalom to come into Jerusalem, and gave him a big hug and a whole bunch of kisses, it would have been him saying, Absalom, we're okay now. Absalom, it's all right. It's just like in a Middle Eastern culture where, where someone sets down for a meal. If you sit down for a meal with someone, you are saying, I agree with this person. That's why the Pharisees had such a problem with Jesus sitting down with the publicans and sinners. In their mind, for Jesus to sit down with the publicans and sinners is to, is to just say, I'm with them. I agree with you. I'm your friend. It's what, not what Jesus was saying. But that's the way that they took it. And he is expecting his father to rebuke him and maybe even not to give him audience. You see, what most fathers in that culture would have done is they would have stood up on that hill and they would have let everybody from uh, their, their little group there, all the workers, and they would let everybody go out in the shame that they would have experienced before they ever even got to speak to the Father. He's walking in with shame. Shame's not the problem. He's got that, but the issue is the Father's reaction. He runs to him. He runs to his son as fast as he can. The Greek word that's used here, it literally means to sprint. You know what it is for a Middle Eastern man to sprint in their garb that they wear? Even to this day, it is a shame. It's a shame for a man to show his bare legs. It's a shame for a man to run. And this, this father, he throws caution to the wind. I don't care what anyone thinks about me. I'm running to my son. And so he pulls up his whatever you call that thing that he's wearing, and he runs wide open as fast as he can to his son, and he falls on him, and he gives him a hug, and he gives him, and it makes him sound like he gives him a kiss, like, oh, son, it's so good to see you. Let me give you a kiss. No, that ain't what it means. The word that's used here, it means, like, basically rapid kissing. He is kissing his son all over his face. Incidentally, it is the same word that is used for Judas's kiss. Remember, Judas runs up to Jesus, and he says, Master, Master! And he kisses Jesus with that kiss of betrayal. Now, that was a bunch of kisses of betrayal. You have the woman that, that washes Jesus' feet, and it says that she kissed his feet, and you skip down about ten verses, and it says that she ceased not to kiss his feet. So this, this father, he wraps his arms around his son and he's saying, welcome home. Welcome home, son. I accept you back. And as you go through this story, you remember the, the, the son's thinking. He makes this statement in verse 19 to himself. He says, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thine hired servants. But he doesn't say that when he gets there and meets his father. He doesn't ask, Father, will you make me one of your hired servants? And the reason for that is because he knows right off the bat, I don't have to be a servant. I don't have to work this off. Because the father puts his best robe on him. 
The father puts a ring, a signet ring on his hand, which is basically like a credit card of the day. He's like, welcome home, son. You know who took the shame and who took the reproach? The father. The shame and the reproach that that son should have experienced as the result of coming back home after his ridiculous spending spree and riotous living, he should have been mocked, he should have been beaten, he probably should have even been kicked out in their culture. But the father says, welcome home. The other son has a huge problem with this. But you want to know what was going through the mind of the Pharisees at that moment? This is preposterous. No father would do that. After being dishonored in such a great way, no father would just say, Oh, son, come on back home. I'll give you everything that you lost. I'll give you your place back. This is going to be wonderful. Let's throw a party. You know what the passage tells us? God reacts the same way every time one sinner comes to repentance. One. You know what that means is going on in heaven right now? When it talks about the angels rejoice every time one sinner comes to repentance, there's a party going on in heaven right now. Every time somebody gives their life to Christ, every time someone comes to the Father and says, Father, I have sinned. I have sinned against you. I have sinned against heaven. I messed up. But because he values you, he gives you the opportunity to have a life that is not characterized by guilt. It's not characterized by shame. It's not characterized by anxiety of whether or not God is going to meet your needs because He loves you so much that He sent His Son to pay the ultimate price for you. He sent His Son to be shamed on your behalf. He sent His Son to take your sin and your iniquity on Himself. He gave it all for you. You were that doggy that was lost. And God searched for you. And He came out and He met you. And he tells the other son, He says, This is my son who was dead and now lives. Are you alive this morning? And when it comes to your heart and how you deal with your anxiety and how you deal with your guilt and how you deal with your shame, are you living according to how the Father has blessed you or are you living according to this is what I want to do and this is what I think would make me happy just like this son did. Philippians tells us in Philippians chapter 2 that God did not consider, or that He did not consider equality with God to be something to His advantage. You see, Jesus should not have stepped off that throne in glory. In reality, should He have given everything for you? No way. But he did. And he did it because he loves us. And he loves us not because of anything that we are and not because of anything that we have to offer, but he loves us because he places great value on that thing which is lost. And when you're found, you mean so much more. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to open your word. We thank you for uh, the prodigal son 
most importantly for the Father's reaction. And Father, we thank you that this is how you react to us. In spite of who we are, you place great value on us. And you provide our needs. Father, help us to come to the place where we're willing to surrender every part of our lives to you and to your will and to your glory. From our money all the way up to the most complex things in our life. We pray that you would receive all the glory and all the honor as a result of it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.